time, we'll have our children's church dismissed. Take your Bibles this morning. Let's go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, please. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to challenge you this morning from this chapter and many others in the Bible we'll be reading this morning on being content is the best life. You know, as, as Paul talks to us throughout the, his epistles, he shows a life that is far from anything that we would choose. Uh, we would not necessarily choose the life that Paul did, but God chose it for him. And he challenges us, and it's like it's written today, because Timothy's a young preacher coming up, and he as his mentor and as his uh, spiritual father begins teaching him some things about the ministry. And one of the things that, as always, he knows the ministry is not a flush place to make a living. It is a place to serve. Amen? And so he wants to encourage because what the devil's going to do is immediately try to sidetrack him any way possible. And this is where he says that, hey, money is essential, but money's not the goal. But in it, he's trying to tell him that you live in a rich society. You're in Ephesus. Ephesus is a very wealthy, wealthy city. It is a main shipping port. It is a main hub. It has got all of the things a man would need. But don't forget that with God, everything is perfect. And he goes in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. He says, strive for something different than the world's offering. He said, godliness with contentment is great gain. But he, he goes on, for we brought nothing into this world and certainly we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us, there, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil which will some covet it after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as we bow before your throne, we ask you that you would use this message to challenge us that contentment with godliness is great gain. Help us to focus on the great things you have blessed us with our salvation, our life that you've blessed us with, our very breath that we breathe. We are so blessed to our homes, to our families, to our income. Whatever you've blessed us with, Lord, allow us to be content and be frugal and redeem the time because the days are evil. Lord, we ask you to use this message to challenge us and equip us for the days ahead, for you know which tomorrow holds. Lord, I ask you that you'd give me the words to say, maybe the words each and every one needs to hear, in person and online, in Jesus' precious name, amen. As he says here, for we brought nothing into this world. When I was born at 2.27 a.m., I had nothing but my birthday suit, amen, and so did you. And when I leave, they're going to put a suit on me. They're going to put some makeup on me. They're going to make me look good. But they're going to have some stuff on me. But it's not going to heaven. It's going to rot just like everything else will. What's going to go is my spirit, my soul. That's what matters. You know, many people say, well, I've got to have this. I've got to have that. I read something the other day from a pastor, and he said, in 100 years, Someone's going to live in your home. Someone's going to be using your money in your bank account, whatever. 
And he goes, what you have today is priceless. But so many people are working for today. They don't live for today. And that's what the challenge is. Being content is the best life. There are people that they're not going to stop. I know people I work with. They're seven days a week. Work, 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 work. Got to get that next dollar. Got to get whatever. Does it matter that next dollar? It's always out of reach, isn't it? It's like that carrot on the stick, you know, a little bit farther, a little bit farther. And next thing you know, you're 30, you're 40, you're 50, you're 60, and you're still chasing that dollar. Your kids have grown up. Your grandkids are growing up. You might have had a marriage, whatever. For what? When we look at our world today, there used to be a time when our country relished in giving thanks. Now it's just another holiday. You know, there's more Halloween decorations than Thanksgiving decorations. Really? And next thing you know what? It's going to go right into Christmas. And right after that, they're going to be moaning that everybody went into debt for Christmas. And they're missing the point. Christmas wasn't a holiday to see how much we can get. Christmas was a holiday to celebrate what we got through Christ. Thanksgiving was a time to sit down from the very first settlers, both in Canada and the United States, came here persecuted with nothing. Went through some of the hardest winters and diseases and everything like that. And they sat down to give thanks. Took them months to cross the ocean. When we can cross it in a matter of hours in an airplane. And they arrived. And they were on our soil saying, thank you, God. Do we ever stop when we get done traveling and say, thank you, God, for a safe trip? Do we ever stop and give thanks for what we eat? Because at least we have food. You know, it's, it's, this is our world we live in, being content. Hey, I may not have this, but I don't really need this. That's how we need to look at things. And this is, it is Thanksgiving once again. And across the country, millions of Canadians are getting ready for a week of great celebrations. They're already brand. Many have started last night. Many of them have them today, tomorrow, everything. They're going to be traveling. They're going to be this. Everybody's closed, ready for Thanksgiving. But are they giving thanks? I'm sure there's going to be some food fights today and tomorrow. I'm sure there's going to be some families leaving angry at each other, more anger than they came that because some sports team didn't win or politics didn't come up right or, or somebody didn't like somebody. And can you imagine going to a dinner like that? You know what I do? Just don't go. <laughs> if you know it's going to turn out bad, just don't. Aren't you glad when you get together and there's laughter, there's remembering, there's remembrance, there's good times. That's what Thanksgiving is about. And then there's a time to say, I want to give thanks. That's what the Bible says. You know, around our country, Monday, millions should stop to give thanks. Should. For what we have. It is one day our nation set aside to give thanks. And why aren't we anymore? You know, you remember, there used to be, really did, Where our prime minister would give a radio call to give thanks. That's been, I don't remember the last one. Why not anymore? Because it's not important. Because they would have to give credit to God. And that would be something horrible. (laughs) The Bible says in Philippians Chapter 4, verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. But also, look at chapter 4 and verse 6. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. 
in everything give thanks. That's the essence of what he's saying. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry. Trust God. In everything give thanks. You know what it says in verse 7? I love verse 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If I have the right attitude, I'm not going to worry about what I don't have. I'm not going to worry about what tomorrow may bring because you know what? How many can raise their hand and say, you're going to be here tomorrow at 8 o'clock? You're foolish. So am I. <laughs> I don't know. Just because I am 51 does not mean I'm going to live to 52. And for me to say, hey, I'll, I'll see you guys. You know what the Bible says in James? Don't do it. Say, if the Lord will, if the Lord will, I'll see you later. Because if he doesn't, hey, you may be planting me before any of you go. Consider me lucky. No, just kidding. <laughs> but I don't know. That's why we live today because we may not be here tomorrow. Turn me to Psalms 100. Psalms 100, verse 4. David, for all that David went through, isn't it neat how he always found time to give thanks to God? Here's a man that his brothers rejected him. He says, go home, you dreamer. <laughs> hey, just go home. What are you doing here, gawking at us? What is there to look at? You guys are a bunch of cowards. You're sitting on the side polishing your sword going, that's a mean giant. <laughs> and you walk over there with nothing but a, sailor, uh, uh, a, um, a sack of rocks and a shepherd's outfit. And you face the most fearsome giant there is. While the rest of the soldiers are going, I'm a little scared. It's a little, even King goes, here, good boy. Here's my armor. Didn't fit him. That's the funny, you know, even the king was in his tent going to give a teenager his armor instead of donning it himself and going, the power of God's with me. And that's exactly what David says. I stand with the power of God. We've got to realize this. We sometimes forget who is on our side. We sing that song, who is on the Lord's side. Count your many blessings, name that one. Be still my soul and know that he's with you. Abide in me. All these great hymns that have been written by some great, it is my father's world. And Psalms 100 and verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. You know, you just look down to the next verse in 101, verse 1. I will sing of his mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. <laughs> he, David's that way. I'm going to sing of his mercy. Did he always have the right path in life? No. Did he always get the green light and every, the, the train switched to the right time? No. David had to run and hide from Saul for years. You think about this. God promised him to be king. And the current king didn't get out of the way fast enough. He had to teach him a lesson. He had to teach him patience. He had to teach him hope, trust, faith. Things that sometimes we want to be able to just turn that switch and things go our way. I, I was just pondering the message this morning thinking about how many times my life this year the track has changed. Boy, if you ask me where I would be on October 8th, I guarantee you this would not have been my choice. But January 1st, there was a different path. But God's like, okay, I'm going to switch the tracks on you a couple times. You know what? And I look back and say, it was exactly what I needed but if you asked me back then, it was like, no, I'm not ready for it. And I'm still not ready for it. But that's where you have to take one step at a time. Enter into his gates with praises and thanksgiving. 
I read a a story in a book I was going through this week. And a friend of mine sent me just it's called Tragedy Triumph Out of Tragedy. And I read this story and it just it hit home in a lot of ways. And he says the author's writing he says I know a family in South Chicago where this Thanksgiving will be six empty chairs around the table. It's hard to even think about this pastor. What it is, what is it you said? God has demonstrated his love to our family. There's no question in our minds that God is good and we praise him in all things. Either that man has lost his mind or he has found his faith. I'll be honest, I don't know what I would say if it were my three boys taken in a fiery death. I suppose in that moment God gives grace for what you have to bear or whatever strength you have to have. But I'm not sure. And I'll finish the story in a minute. But I want you to think about this. God has demonstrated his love to our family. There is no question in our minds that God is good and we will praise him in all things. You think about 1620. The pilgrims were being persecuted for their faith in Christ by another religious denomination because they did not side with the Church of England. They were being persecuted. A group of several hundred gathered enough money to rent a ship. Think about that. To rent a ship to go to North America. To go to the Americas as it's called. Actually, believe it or not, there were actually several ships. And both of our countries, United States and Canada, were settled with pilgrims leaving persecution. Some settled in a place called Nova Scotia. Other place settled in a place called Massachusetts. But they all left for the same reason. Freedom of worship. It is well known fact that the pilgrims came because of their Christian faith. They came to the Americas because they loved God. Because they believed that God was leading them. They were not rebellion, rebellious. They just wanted to be biblical Christians who believed that the Almighty God had brought them and will take care of them. William Bradford in his book of the Plymouth Plantation tells of the reaction of the pilgrims when they landed at Cape Cod. Being thus arrived in good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over this vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and the miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. And no marvel if they were thus joyful. Peter Marshall commented on that and said, Thus had begun their long journey by kneeling on the dock of Bell's Haven to ask God's blessing. They ended it on the sands of Cape Cod, kneeling to thank the Almighty for their blessings of safe travels. But the sad thing is they lost over 20 families to disease on the ship. And yet they blessed for safe travels. Can you imagine in that time the common cold could kill you? So many diseases happened and the first winter most of the village were decimated. If it wasn't for the North American Indians coming and helping them in both of our countries, believe it or not, giving them, and you know what? That is when they set aside to give thanks. And actually Canada is recorded earlier than the United States of giving thanks. And where are we today? How sad our nation has declined to where the Almighty, those that settled our shores, gave thanks to the Almighty 
And now we give thanks to what? What is the secret of living a content, thankful life? Why is it that some people approach this holiday with rejoicing and others with trepidation and disappointment? Some people are not looking forward to the holiday. Some of you know Thanksgiving will either, either mean a day of loneliness or a day of busyness or just another day of work. Or perhaps a day of family that is about to push the strife beyond the surface. Some of us look over the past 12 months and say, I don't really have much to be thankful for. Others say, I don't have enough books to write what I'm thankful for. And as you face Thanksgiving, you are just contemplating to be another Ebenezer Scrooge, bah humbug. On the whole life thing, I don't have anything to be grateful. Or you can be a tiny Tim and be grateful for what you have. What is the secret to being grateful in all circumstances? I'm going to give you the secret. It is in just one word. It is in the word contentment. And you know where that word comes from? I've learned to be content in whatever state I am. How did he say this? Because he knew Jesus Christ. His secret, Paul's secret was this one verse, for I know whom I believe. That is a secret. As the world goes round and round to do their thing and try to figure out what Tuesday morning is going to hold. I'm not worried about tomorrow morning. I know what tomorrow morning holds. I know what Tuesday morning holds. But will it happen? When the Apostle Paul says, would you like to know the definition of contentment? Contentment is realizing how much you already have. How much God has already given you. How rich you are in Him. The problem with many of us today is we approach Thanksgiving focused on the circumstances of life. Far too many of us take our happiness and our joy and our contentment by how things are going on the outside. The Bible says it is not like that. Contentment is not a matter of outward circumstances. Contentment is a matter of understanding how much we already have in Him. The book of Proverbs is probably the most rich book in the Bible with wisdoms. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 9. Let's go to a couple and let's learn a few things this morning. And then I'm going to teach you three things. Add to your blessings. Subtract your losses. And multiply your promises. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 9 the Bible says, He that is despised and hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. The verse that always cheers me up when I read it. Better to have no reputation to be thought of as nothing and yet have your needs met than be a big bag of hot air and lack everything. It doesn't matter what people think of us. You know what? People that tear people down, they have nothing anyway. And to tear you down, they make them feel, feel better. We've all worked with corporate type people. I've worked in the corporate world. My back was a ladder rung to get someone better. So what? <laughs> Go to the top of the ladder. You know what I found at the top of the ladder? It's more responsibility. I'll be at the bottom. Thank you. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'm that guy's, but you know what people? They want that recognition. I don't need that recognition. Because I've already been recognized as a son of God. Proverbs 15 verse 16. The Bible says a lot about things. You know what the Bible says here? Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. I've worked for a lot of people. You know what I found out? There's a lot of problems in people's lives. They use money. They use drugs. Sadly, I've known some people that 
They always got to get remarried. Why? For a trophy wife. I've got a trophy wife. Been with her 30 years. But what? So people say, oh, wow, look at that fellow. Yeah, but I bet he's miserable. I know he's miserable. But that's our world today. And is it better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth? And a whole lot of problems. You can have it. Too many of us have bought into the notion that money brings happiness. It does not. Fame brings happiness. It does not. Friends bring happiness. It does not. Ask the prodigal son how well his friends did when the money ran out. <laughs> Proverbs 15, verse 17. Look at the Bible says here. Better is a dinner of herbs with love than it is a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Hey, better translated in our term, better to eat cold beans where people love you than a T-bone steak where they can't stand to look at your face. It's better to eat with people that love you with some beans and weenies, amen? <laughs> with some possums in a can. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 8? Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. We have a lot of dishonest people in our world. It's better to have a little and know you earned it right, amen? There is nothing like going to bed with your head on the pillow knowing I did it right than to cheat someone to get your wealth. These are things, better is a little righteousness. Look at verse 19, same chapter. Better is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Chapter 17, verse 1 goes right along with this. Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. It's better to have a peaceful home with very little than it is a house full of riches and a whole lot of arguing. That is what Thanksgiving and Christmas are for too many people. A house full of feasting with strife. Boy, I, I like our family. We're a bag of nuts. But we roast together nicely, amen? Even when I you know, sit with my parents and parents-in-law, there's always a joy around the table as we give thanks. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 6, Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. What is contentment? Contentment in Christ is realizing we are better off in the right than in the wrong. What does a happy Thanksgiving mean to us? You have to add something, subtract something, and multiplying something, and divide something. So tonight, this morning, we're going to look at a mathematical equation. And you'll have to let me know how it adds up because I stink in math. But add your blessings. Count your blessings. Deuteronomy, the Lord says the following to the people of Israel. They're frightened. They're scared. And Joshua stands before them. They have wandered for 40 years. Jericho and Jordan are looming before them. And they're looking at, and they said, boy, these nations are strong. The 12 spies come by and go, the men are, are huge. <laughs> Here's the grapes. We're like grasshoppers to them. Yeah. Joshua and Caleb stand up and go, we can do it. 10 go, no, we can't. God says, you missed the point. Don't be afraid of your future. Remember, if God be for you, who can be against you? In the first step to have a content filled life is to have a good remembering of God's blessings. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. 
we have really been blessed. If you were to add a book of blessings to your life this year and write down every little thing, you honestly wouldn't have time to think of all the negatives in your life. We have been blessed. The problem is we will dwell on the negatives of life. Get over it. We are blessed. It has not been easy being a pastor. It has not been easier being in the ministry. I could focus on the negative and quit. This month, 800 ministers across North America will quit. Think about that number, 800. Why? For a myriad of reasons. Do you realize less than 103 will join the ministry a month? That's a 600 plus deficit. Why? Discouragement. The top three reasons ministers quit. Discouragement. Finances. And family. It gets tough. I know about two of them. But here's the thing. If you let and focus on the negative, you'll never see the positive. And he's, Paul says, in whatever state, whether he's rich, whether he's poor, whether he's in prison, beaten, back raw, whether he's being stoned, whether he's being cast out, whether he's shipwrecked, whether he's hungry, he gives us list. I've learned to be content. We got to look on the God side, not our side. Because he is the bright side. Take a moment to remember at least three blessings God has sent in your life in the past 12 months and add to them. Three blessings. The Bible says as Moses challenged young Joshua he says be of good courage. God is on your side. As he stood and looked at Jericho that big river and he says be of good courage in Joshua 1.8. We got to remember when we start looking at our blessings, be of good courage. Think about what God has done. And at the end of the book of Joshua, he stands and he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He hadn't wavered in his commitment to God, no matter what he's gone through. Just like Moses, they revolted against Joshua. Even though he was a godly man, they still didn't want a godly choice. The first step is count your blessings. The second step is subtract your losses. Don't put that in equation. As Job says, as he's kneeling down in sackcloth and ashes, he's ripped his clothes off, he's put burlap sack on, he's covered himself with ashes, he's on the ground, his sons and daughters are dead. His wealth is all gone and he kneels down, he lifts his hands up and he says, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I return, blessed be the name of the Lord. He subtracted his losses. None of us have ever experienced that kind of traumatic loss. And he prays the Lord. The next chapter his wife says, curse God and die and be better with you. And he says no. In Romans 8.28, as we turn there, Romans 8.28, we may not understand why God allows us. We get this attitude, and I've been there. My wife and my family will tell you, I can get in a very bad woe is me. But let me ask you, some of you are older than me, some are younger than me, does woe is me attitudes fix anything? <laughs> nope. 
Problem out of the pity party, I'm only the one invited. <laughs> no one else shows up to my party. They don't want to be a part of my party. Why? No one wants to be around a downer. I learned that. And really, what do we have to be down about? My wife and family have been a great encouragement to me when I was broken. And they have to remind me. Even now, with all that's on my plate, take one day at a time. Take one day at a time. And that's why the Bible says in 828, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of a son that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Nothing caught God by surprise. He didn't like, oh man, I didn't see that in the calendar. I forgot about his house lease is coming up. <laughs> Oops, I'll remember that next time. Aren't you glad God's not like that? Oh man. No, that's me, not him. But subtract your losses. For we know that all. But the Bible also says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't understand the mind of God because I'm not God. He made you like you are. And he made each one of us strong. You think about this. Through Christ, the strength is real. And as we look at life, we can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. We, what are your losses? What are your difficulties? What are your defeats? What are your failures? What are your humiliations? Times in the last year when it didn't work out the way you thought it was going to. When you look at your life, these are things that come into the debt column. Subtract them right now. Maybe it's bitterness and resentment or broken relationship. We all have a past, some worse than others. But as my mom always taught us, we can be bitter or we can be better. The choice is ours. My mom got on to me one time. I was struggling in school. And she said, son... She goes, the problem you're not letting your problems of failure go is because you don't want to. Boy, that was just like a poker in my eye. She was right. I wanted a pity party. I wanted everybody to pity me. And she wasn't going to pity me. Just like when I didn't like green peas. She goes, would you have rotten rat? Good point. Green peas are good. <laughs> you know, would you write like rotten donkey? Would you like to grind up the eggshells instead of having milk? She asked me, tough. She said, would you like to go to an open cesspool that 3,000 other people are using? In the middle of July. Think about this. She would always bring out, what are you whining about? <laughs> Do you see me whining? I'm not whining, so what are you whining about? Your father and I have taken good care of you. But she would always say, is because you're not willing to let it go. She said one time, she says, when you let go, you begin to live free. We can live in bondage to our own resentments, to our own past, to our own failures. Because I couldn't understand a subject, I was not good in math. And I would always beat myself. You know what it did? It made me do worse. Because I had the mind to, I couldn't do it. When I started thinking I can do it, I may not be good at it, may not be for forte, but I can get through math. I started doing better. This is the thing. Will you begin to live free? Now the story. Wednesday morning, Pastor Scott and Janet put their kids in a minivan and took off from Milwaukee. They had no idea. It was just another trip. Six of their kids were with them. 
Pastor Scott said, I barely had time to think. I saw the metal fly off the truck and the minivan rolled over it and punctured the gas tank, exploding immediately. Five of the children were burned to death within seconds. The sixth, Ben, 13 years old, lived one more day in the burn unit before he died. It's hard to even speak of this. This is what the Chicago Tribune said. Pastor Scott and his wife Janet, hands bandaged to their faces, bearing the marks of severe flames, gave the press conference. And he says, there are only two possible responses to the kind of losses that we suffered this week. Utter despair and unquestionable faith. For us, despair was never an option. I know God has a purpose and God has reasons. Pastor Scott said explaining how he and his wife had been able to cope with the death of six of their nine children in a split second. God has demonstrated his love to us and our family. There is no question in our minds that God is good and we praise him in all things. His wife Janet said through tears, he is the giver and taker of our life. He sustains us. Pastor Scott serves at Parkwood Baptist Church in Mount Greenwood in South Chicago. In the accident, six children died. Ben 13, Joe 11, Sam 9, Hank 7, Elizabeth 3, and Peter 6 weeks old. There is no question or a mind, he says, that God is good and we praise him for all things. What would you say? How would you respond? Utter despair, as the newspaper put it, or unquestionable faith? There is no question or a minds that God is good and we praise him in all things. Subtract the negatives in your life. We may not understand, just as my sister a couple days before Christmas buried her daughter and her husband. Been almost 20 years since they passed. Her daughter would be almost 38 years old. And who knows what her life would bring. But you look at things, we may not understand all that there is and why God allows things. But the Bible says, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Multiply your promises. First Peter talks about exceeding great and precious promise of God. The Bible is a book filled with promises of God. This is what we should do. Is study the promises of God. Think about the promises that God has made to you. And for you. And about you. Promises that you are hanging on to or should be. Write down at least three promises, God, for you. Are you memorizing scriptures? God gave it to you. He gave you the promise that you may hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against him. What, what is a sin? Doubting what he can do. Doubting that he can help you overcome. You know what my mom said? Gordon, instead of being negative about what you can't do and about how you failed in this and how you have to step back a grade, why don't you pray and ask God to give you strength to overcome this instead of being in your little pity party and doing worse? So reluctantly, I began to pray, Lord, I hate math. And that's how I pray. Help me get through it. And guess what? He did. I made a C instead of an F. I told my mom F was for fantastic. She said, no, it wasn't. But you know, it wasn't. So when I got through with my math, they says, would you go to business math or geometry? I said, we're going to pass all by geometry. And when that teacher says, I'll use algebra the rest of the life, I want to tell him I, he lies. He said, you'll never use calculators. I got my phone. <laughs> but you know, Mom was right. Praying sure does help. Because there are things I can't do. There are things I have to pray in the ministry. God, I can't do this. God, I don't have the strength to do this. 
I need your help. Whether it's a wedding, whether it's a funeral, whether it's a sermon, or whether it's counseling and anything else, I can't do this. But God can. Multiply your promises. As I'm as I was packing up my office, I've had it since 2007, knowing that this will be the last time I use it, I found notes from members over the last 20 years just thanking me for all that I've done and I haven't felt like I've done that much. But those are the promises that God gives you. And as I was looking at notes and I came across the jar of this church gave me a couple years ago when the pastor's appreciation filled with little notes and I moved over to this office and I thought, thank you, Lord, for the family you've given me over the last 20 years. They're awesome. You know, some have gone, some have walked away from God. A lot of the notes that I read have. And that broke my heart even more. And I thought, Lord, wherever they're at today, bring them back to you. That's the hardest thing for a pastor is to read the notes and to see how many people have actually turned their back on God to go the way of the world. I kind of felt like Paul did, for Demas has forsaken me. The Bible says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with what things you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Psalms 91 verse 1 He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wing shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. David is writing, and he goes, I'm not going to worry, for I'm under his wing. It is the best place to be. Job says, in essence, I know the way he knows the way I should take. And when I was tried, I shall come forth as gold. Our trials are not always easy, but God has a purpose for them. Psalms 1 verse 5, the Bible says, He watches over us and keeps us safe from the wicked. If you're ever discouraged, multiply your promises. Subtract the negatives and add your blessings. But how about dividing your burdens? It's hard to bear our burdens. But I learned from my dad too. Our burdens are our burdens sometimes. And we can burden someone down with too much burdens. The problem is, my dad would say, we don't take our burdens to the one who can bear all burdens. I can only bear as your pastor so much burdens. You can only bear so much burdens. We're just human. But we know someone that can take his yoke upon us. It's heavy for us, but we cast all of our cares. Notice it says, bear one another's burdens, but it says, cast all your cares upon him. So together, we can learn to throw our burdens to him. Divide our burdens by taking on someone else's burdens 
and giving all of our burdens to God. We're there for each other, but we're also there to point each other to the one who can bear. I can't heal burdens. I can't heal hearts. I can't fix things. But you know what I know? I go to the one that can. He's a healer. He's a marriage fixer. He's a problem patcher. He's everything else you can think. Amen? I can't do it. I'd love to. Boy, I'd have super glue everywhere. <laughs> you know. But I have to give them to God. Because even sometimes burdens for all of us get heavy. Maybe we should give God a chance to divide our burdens. Maybe we should give God a chance to let go and let God. Years ago, most of you know that I suffered from severe depression and discouragement and anxiety. Broken, but I had to get to the point where my family could only help me so much. I had to get to the point where I had to say, God, I cannot live like this. I need your help. Guess what? It's still there. My wife has to remind me, deep breath, take one day at a time. She knows the signs to when I'm getting to the point where I'm going to snap. But guess what? Her burden bearing gets to a point point and says, have you been taking it to God? Have you been taking it to God? You have to. She can only bear so much of me. <laughs> My family can only bear so much of me before they, we break them as well. This is where the greatest thing is. We got to give it to God. There's been a lot of praying lately. There's been a lot of God. There's been a lot of things. But you know what? Instead of focusing on our own problems, think about what God can do with them. God is the one that can handle everything. He knows all about me. The Bible says he knows everything about my frame. <laughs> And he can still bear it. Contentment. What is contentment? What is the contentment Paul is talking about? It's realizing how much you already have in Christ. You are better off than we think we are. The devil wants to think that we have a poor woe is me life. Oh no. I'm rich. You know it's just everything about my life. And my church. You know what going to other churches see? Realize what a great church I have. You know what to go in other places and traveling? No other place than home. It is nice to be back at home. I'm a home buddy. God's allowed me to do some traveling. Don't particularly care for it. I'm a home buddy. I love my own family, my own bed, my own animals, everything else. I love home. If I didn't have to go anywhere, I wouldn't. Amen? That's contentment. Some people are not happy at home. Some people are got to go, 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 go because they don't want to be home. I can't wait to get home. My wife will tell you, I never leave her alone. I'm always calling her because I love my wife and I love my family. I like to share my life with my family. God has given us more than we realize. There is no question in our minds that God is good and we should praise him in all things. Do you think about those others that are heavy hearts too? Could we say to them, are we looking to God? Or are we looking to ourselves? We all have burdens. We all have pasts. And we all have a future. Do we want to let our burdens, as Brother Nye would say in one of his messages, our burdens are sin or our boat anchor. <laughs> You can't go in. You can put full throttle with a boat anchor, but you're not going to go anywhere until you snap that chain. Let's break the chains on our past. The past holds us back from being better. Because of my mom and encouragement, I went from an F to a C. We can get better by letting go and letting God take care of our past. Because tomorrow 
But don't wait till tomorrow. In everything, give thanks. You know what? You're breathing today. That's a good thing to give thanks for. You're going to go home, Lord willing, and go have a dinner with family. Amen. And you're not going to walk home in the rain. You're going to drive home. That's another blessing. And everything, give thanks. Let's not focus on the negative. Let's focus on God. Maybe our prayer is, God, give us the eyes to see your blessing. Give us the hands ready to reach out and help those in need. Give us the heart to rejoice in you and lips to sing your praise. Help us to understand that whether we see it or not, whether we know it or not, whether we want to know it, whether we feel it or not, you are good all the time and worthy of our praise. This week, for you and I, may it be a day of true thanksgiving to God who is good all the time. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as the psalmist says, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy holy name. Help us to give thanks for what we have today. Help us to look beyond ourselves and look to the Son of God who loves us so much. Lord, maybe there's someone in the sanctuary or all those attending online Maybe they're at a point in their life where they don't know how to really give thanks because they've never experienced faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, may this be the morning that they give their heart and life to Jesus Christ to where they can understand that true peace that passes all understanding. Help us to realize that the devil loves for us to relish in our failures, in our past, in our difficulties, in our circumstances. Help us to realize that you are the God of hope and God of change and a God of forgiveness. Lord, may we cast all our cares upon you, our burdens, our circumstances, our trials, and say, God, I already give thanks for what you're about to do. And may this Thanksgiving Day 2023 be a day of tremendous joy and peace as we give thanks to the Almighty for what He's done, where He's brought us, and how He supplied our ever needs according to His riches and glory. May we be like this Pastor Scott, and give thanks even in the midst of all his loss and suffering. Lord, how tragic that must have been. But what a step of faith for him and his wife. Thank you for all you've done for us and all that you're going to do. Dismiss with your blessing. Bring us back this evening at five as we worship. Give each and every one a traveling mercy, send time with their family. And may they make a point to give thanks to you for all their bountiful blessings. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. And look forward to seeing you again morning tonight at 5 o'clock. And may you have a great Thanksgiving. And may you take time to celebrate what God has done for you. Lord bless and have a great day.